Mohammed Mali and Ashita Shankar. And if you can tell us about how to write your homework. Thanks, Valentin. This is a joint work with my students, Tulasi and Ashutosh. For a variety of reasons, they could not make it here. Unfortunately, you'll have to hear me talk instead of them. Like the other talks in this session, this is going to be continue on the power of small depth computation, but we'll return to the Boolean world. Uh, this one is not a the algebraic computation. So you know, the two central characters in our story is, is going to be of AC0 circuits and AC0 formulae. We would like to understand and to the power of these against uh, power of these, the relative powers of these. And thanks to the previous speakers, especially Vinayak, he set up most of the introduction that I had to give for AC0 circuits, AC0 formula that I have. I can skip a fair amount and go to the main meat of the talk. So if you can skip all of this, the only key thing which I would like Notice is actually a point which Sebastian mentioned, that is when you have an AC0 uh, uh, size S depth D plus one AC0 circuit and you convert it to an AC0 formula. So what's the difference between a formula and a circuit? It's basically the internal gates uh, don't have, have fan and one in formula as opposed to circuits. When you do this conversion, you do the sort of the naive conversion to repeat each gates as many times, then the size blows up from S to S to the D. And what we would like to understand in most of this talk is this, this way to convert a circuit to a formula unavoidable, at least in the context of computing parity. So we'll be trying to understand the power of AC0 circuits, AC0 formula against the adversary parity. So we'll go on to this one. Actually, we think back, it so sort of seems that we answered most of the questions, power of AC0 circuits and AC0 formula against parity. Is there anything more to, we sort of have a very clear understanding of it. So what I'll try to impress you in the next five or six minutes is there are still some questions that we don't yet know of the power of AC0 formula and AC0 circuits against the parity function. I'm only going to be talking about their power with respect to the parity function. Say that there are still some questions which we don't fully understand. And what I'll do in the later half of the talk is impress on you what we managed to contribute in this picture. So, so what do we know about how well does AC0 formula and AC0 circuits compute parity? So you can talk about various depths. So let's begin with depth one, which is just ands and ors. Ands and ors cannot compute parity. These are ands and or functions as one. But moment you come to depth two, you can compute parity, but you require very low. The, the upper, you can compute a, a, a parity using a AC0 a circuit of size two power n minus one. Same case for, for formulae. And then what about when you go to larger and larger depths? So depth three and all, those are the best numbers that's given. And that's basically you use this inductive approach. For example, how do you get the two to the square root 10? You write the parity of n bits as a square root 10 parity of square root 10 uh, parities each. Compute AC, AC0 circuits of depth two for each of them and then collapse use one. That's how you get the two to the square root 10 and you use this idea inductively to get the two to the n to the one over d upper bound for parity. Uh, of AC0 circuits against parity. And then the natural, and then what's written, that's the first column of uh, un indicated AC0 circuits. What about AC0 formula? You just do this naive thing, which I said in the first slide, that is convert every AC0 circuit of depth D into a formula by blowing a size S circuit into a size S to the D uh, circuit. And that's exactly what we have got over here. Okay, so that's what we know from upper bounds. This is what AC0 circuits and AC0 formula, how can they compute parity? What I would like to ask is, are all these numbers given in this fig tight? Hmm? For depth two, it's not hard to see that that's the best you can do. You need two to the n minus one. What about for larger depths, depth two and onwards? And here is where the idea of random restrictions was used. That is random, you want to distinguish between AC0 circuits and AC0 formula, AC0 circuits and parity. What's one possible tool that can separate them is the notion of random restriction. Parity hardly simplifies when you hit it with a random restriction, whereas AND and OR gates dramatically simplify this one. So you could use these to reduce the depth, and then at depth one, you know how to distinguish these two are very different. You use the basic lower bone. And so since quite some time, for more than 40 years, for four decades or five decades, the power of random restrictions were used as a very powerful tool to understand the power of low depth computation. And what do we know in this context? So 
first Saxon Sipser pioneered the use of the switching lemma. They suggested the switching lemma as a powerful technique to actually try to understand the power of AC0 circuits. This was further improved by Aitai and Yao. And finally comes the our knight in shining armor, Johann Hastad, who gave the switching lemma as we know it today, which basically says the following, that is if F is a, KD, is a DNF formula with bottom fan in K, then if you hit it with a random P restriction, something along the lines, P restriction, random P restriction, which I said in the previous page, then with very high probability, this one simplifies to a decision tree of very low depth. In particular, the probability that it is not, it, the decision tree requires depth more than T is exponentially small in T, and the base of the exponent is phi PK. The reason I'm going to mentioning this one is these numbers will be important to us. So once again, what did Hastad prove? He showed that if you hit a, a DNF formula whose bottom fan in is K with a random re uh, restriction, a random uh, RP restriction, then the probability that the resulting formula, the restricted formula, requires depth more than T, is exponentially small in T, and the base of the exponent is order P, uh, P times K. Okay? And Hastad ex explicitly proved this to get the optimal lower bound for AC0 circuits. In particular, he showed that any depth D plus 1 AC0 circuit computing the n-bit parity function requires size 2 to the omega n, 1 to the D. Hmm? And these immediately gave rise to several other bonds. It gave you Fourier concentration results. It gave you L2 bonds on the Fourier concentration results for some functions computed by these low depth circuits. <laughs> Won't get into these. I'll put them on the slide as we go, but I will not go into these aspects of it. So what we have is this picture. So Hastad basically proved this optimal lower bound for parity against, uh, for uh, AC0 circuits against parity. You can ask immediately is, does the same proof actually work for AC0 formulae? Can you apply it for AC0 formula? And so we know that the formula lower bound, you notice this, what the bound I put here match, the lower and the upper bound match, possibly up to the choice of constant in the omega over there. Question is, do we get, how did we get the upper bound for formula? We just expanded this in the naive way. We took an S size S circuit, made it into a size S to the D circuit. Question is, can we do the same thing over here? And this question actually remained open for quite some time. And one of the reasons for this is because the standard proof of, this, of, the, of Hastad switching lemma is a bottom-up proof. You keep it as, when I pointed out, you hit the bottom gates with a switching lemma, you keep applying restriction. If you're looking at a function, uh, AC0 circuit and AC0 as a bottom-up fashion, you cannot tell apart circuits and formula. You have to look at it from a top-down perspective. You need to have a top, the proof has to have some top-down element in order to distinguish uh, formulas and circuits. And this was the reason why the original proofs did not give you uh, any, did not give you a lower bound. Of course, they give you a lower bound of 2 to the omega n to the 1 over d. Whether you get the be a better factor with the d in the refit was not known. And then several years in, later, in fact, three decades later, comes our second knight in shining armor, Ben Rossman, who showed that this is in fact the case you do get the extra D out there. And this was also an application of Hastad's original switching lemma. He used the switching lemma and a very fancy, clever uh, argument to show that you get the extra D. So his proof had both elem elements of both a bottom-up component, which the switching lemma, the application of switching lemma will be bottom-up, but there was a top-down element to incorporate the fact that he's actually dealing with AC0 formulae and not AC0 circuits. Okay, so that's so much for exact computation of parity by AC0 formula and circuits. I'm going to go a little further. So that's the picture we have now. I'm going to go a little more and ask, OK, suppose we are not interested in computing parity exactly, but we want to compute parity, say, approximately. How well do AC0 circuits and AC0 formulae correlate with parity? In particular, we are interested in this quantity. The correlation of two functions f and g is basically two Boolean functions f and g is a probability f is the difference, is the absolute difference between the probability f computes g and f does not compute g. And we want to know how small is this, how well do, pa so if this is one, the function exactly, com the function f correlates perfectly with g. If it is zero, it completely is uncorrelated with this. And we would like to understand what's the correlation of AC0 circuits with an AC0 formula with parity. Hmm? The initial results of Aitai 
Hastad all did yield you did yield us some correlation results for AC0 circuits against parity, but did not yield the optimal results. Hmm? So this so this question was actually reformulated, reposed again by Rahul Santanam about a decade ago. And after he posted it to Beam Impagas Srinivasan and Impagas Matthews and Paturi had some initial results which gave you exponential correlation bounds. And immediately after the results, Hastad once again came around and gave the optimal correlation results for AC0 pa parity against. In particular, he proved the following result. He showed that if you're, lo you're looking at an AC0 circuit of size S and depth D plus 1, its correlation with n bit parity is exponentially small. It's exponential in minus n, and n is divided by log s to the power d. Notice that this will recover Hastad's original AC0 formula. When the correlation is 1, you exactly get s is 2 to the n to the 1 over d. The correlation is 1, you get recover this. So he proved the, a, core, a strong correlation bound. This is the best correlation bound you can achieve because we can show that you can show that size s depth d plus 1 circuits do achieve this. We can come up with sizes depth d plus 1 circuits that do achieve this correlation with parity. So the tight result. Hastad. Hastad, and how did he prove this? He needed something stronger than the switching lemma. And this is what Hastad's language is called the multi-switching lemma, which is what Vinayak also pointed out in his talk, multi-switching lemma. So it will be convenient for me not to talk about the multi-switching lemma in the language which Hastad stated it, but more in the language of uh, Rossman in some a concept called the criticality of Boolean functions. So let's define this concept, and then I will state the multi-switching lemma in Rossman's language. So what's the criticality so of a function? It's this quantity. It's you take an arbitrary function f. This need not be a DNF, this one, and you hit it with a random p restriction, and you ask what is the probability that the reduced function still has a large de decision tree. Does this go down exponentially in t or not? And if it does goes exponentially in t, what is the base of the exponent? It wanted to be, say it's p lambda. That lambda, the largest, sorry, that should be the smallest lambda uh, such that that holds. It's not the largest lambda, it's the smallest lambda. Uh, so that's called the criticality of the function. For example, what Hastad's uh, switching lemma says is if f was a kdnf, then the criticality of the kdnf is order k. So this is, Rossman introduced this notion of criticality of function. The reason criticality is useful, this is actually a grab from Rossman's paper, says that criticality has, once you show that a function is lambda critical, it immediately yields several consequences. The second of which is the correlation with parity. It gives you uh, decision tree bound uh, sizes, it gives you degree bounds, this one, it gives you L2 correlation, uh, yeah, uh, tail bounds for L2, Fourier L2 norms, it gives you tail bounds for L1. So the criticality is a very useful, understanding the criticality of a function is a very useful thing. It gives you immediately, it gives you several such other consequences. And what Rossman said is basically Hastad's multi-switching lemma stated in the language of this one is what Hastad actually proved is the criticality of AC0 circuits of size S and depth D is at most log S to the power D. Once you have this, you apply the previous corollary and you'll get Hastad's correlation bound statement. So this is just Hastad's multi-switching lemma written in Rossman's language of using criticality. And this yields optimal uh, correlation bounds for parity so of a against AC0 circuits. So that's the picture we have. So once we have, this is the picture we have. We have size lower bonds, we have Hastad's and Rossman's results, and correlation bonds, we have Hastad's results, and all of these are optimal. There's an obvious question, what has ha what happened to the last entry in this two by two grid? What about correlation bounds of AC0 formulae against parity? Now, if you believe the way to construct formulae from circuits was going from S to S to the power D, then that's the figure you should expect over here. The correlation bound should be this. Basically, yes goes to s to the d, therefore you get that extra d to the d over there. And this remained open. And this fact, this is focus. We want to ask, is this actually going to be the correlation bounds of AC0 formula against parity? And notice that this result will imply, so every result here implies the results to the left of it and above it. So in particular, this result would imply 
all the other results. It will, this result will unify all the four results mentioned in out here. And our main state, and before this one, so what was known in this context, the correlation bounds for AC0 formula. So as Rossman studied this problem in the particular, in fact, it was in this context that Rossman defined the notion of criticality. Studied it for a specific AC0 formula, which we call regular AC0 formula. There is AC0 formula in which every depth, every level, have all the gates have the same Fanon. So it's not an imbalance formula. For this, Rossman was able to prove the exact result which he has. And it was conjectured that the same criticality bound holds good for general AC0 formula, not necessarily regular formula. And our main result is basically this Rossman's result, which held for regular formula, actually holds good for arbitrarily AC0 formula. So any formula f computed, any function f computed by a depth d plus 1 and size s AC0 formula, which need not necessarily is regular, has this criticality bound. And immediately, this would give you a bunch of things. It gives you the optimal correlation bounds. It gives you several Fourier concentration bounds and this one. And as I mentioned before, it unifies and strengthens all the previous results which mentioned. So that's the statement of this one. Any questions on this? If I will, the remaining this one, give you a sketch of what the elements that go into the proof of this statement. OK? So what we want to now prove is, ask you, given an AC0 formula of size s depth d plus 1, I would like to understand its criticality. And what's the criticality? Criticality is, let's put this. It's this quantity. It's the largest, smallest lambda, which has, has the same switching lambda-like flavor, but you're not applying to KDNS, you're applying to an arbitrary function. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the three main ingredients that go, notice, uh, go into the proof. As I mentioned before, you're dealing with formulae and not circuits. So there has to be a top-down component to the proof, because that's what's going to distinguish formula and circuits. The proof won't, it would be great if the proof was entirely top-down. But unfortunately, it is not. If we had such a proof, it would be great. Then it will also apply to AC0 circuits with parity gates at the bottom, which we don't know how to handle. So this proof will have elements of both the top-down fashion and the bottom-up. This one. So the three main ingredients that go into the proof, like I say, all of these ingredients were known before. It's part of putting them together that was new in this result. It's sort of we're going to use not just a random restriction, but we'll come up with a tree of random restriction. We'll define a canonical decision tree not for uh, a DNF, but for the entire formula. And finally, we'll use the use of downward closed sets in the proof. So the first of the three. So this is the usual notion of a random restriction. So it is the standard notion. What we want to extend this is we want to extend it for a tree of restrictions. What do I mean? Suppose this is a formula you're dealing with, and we want to come up with a random restriction for it. So usually what one does is just we come up with a restriction pick. We just come up with a random restriction based on the right value of p for the entire formula. What we'll now do is we'll not just come up with one random restriction. We'll come up with a random restriction for each subformula of the entire formula. So it's, that's why it's a tree of restrictions. We're going to have one restriction for each of the subformula. So the top OR gate will have one. The, the bottom AND gates will uh, the AND gates is level one, and all the variables in the bottom, the literals all will have random restrictions. And how will these random restrictions or restrictions be related to each other? They'll, you'll want the following constraint. That is, if any formula is a subformula, if G1 is a subformula of G2, the restriction of G1 should be a further restriction of this one. That is, you should be revealing more and more variables as you go up all the way to the formula. The, the restriction is has as many start quantities at the bottom. And as you keep going higher and up, you're, set, you're going to set more and more variables. And furthermore, these restrictions need, if this, this is a formula, look at it. So the same component can appear multiple times. It's conceivable that the same form, subformula appears several times in the, this one. I'm, we are not going to say that both the restrictions corresponding to both of them should be the same restriction. They could be different restrictions, except that they, each of them get further uh, sort of refined as you keep going higher up the form, 
the formula. So we're going to deal with a tree of restrictions and not just one restriction. And this already has a top-down element to the way it's spun. But how do we come up? We need to define a distribution over such a tree of restrictions. So how do we do that? So, so we want to come up, we want to come up with a distribution over this such that the restriction for the top is exactly the P restriction which we have. The rest are going to be some other arbitrary one. So, so let P be the number, random usual random restriction which we care about. So what we will do, we'll associate with each subformula another number PG, which is the number that we care for, log SG by D to the power minus DG. This is the depth of the formula, the G formula and the size of the corresponding size of the formula. It's not hard to see. I'm, uh, by the way, I'm skipping constants over here. If you set the right constants over there, it's hard to see that these numbers, these are numbers at this point satisfy that the P's actually uh, are large at the bottom and they keep becoming smaller and smaller as you keep going higher up the formula. So these are the P's. And how do we, how are we going to define the random restriction? We're going to do it this way. We're going to take the given, the given formula, we'll first choose the usual way. We just pick a random restriction, rho tilde f, for the top formula, the usual way, as rpf. And then for each subformula, independently as we go down, we will unset some of the variables, so such that the new restriction is rpg. So we independently decide to toss coins, and some of the set variables, we unset them. So as we keep going down, fewer and fewer variables get set. So there's a there's a mother restriction partial assignment at the very top, and it gets sort of, you, un, you, re, you sort of unreveal the variables as you keep going down, and you do this independently for each of the subformula. That's the random restriction we are going to be talking about. It's a tree of restrictions. This is the random tree of restrictions. And notice that every subformula has the right marginal. It will have exactly, its PG will be from RPG, where RPG is the quantity we care about. So that's, that's the ran, set of, it's a distribution of random tree restrictions that we're going to be talking about. What about, let's go to, we're going to now talk about coming up with a canonical decision tree for the entire formula, not just uh, as in the, in the original proof of the switching lemma, we came up with a decision tree for every DNF or a CNF, but now we're going to come up with a decision tree for the entire formula. So given a formula F and this tree row tilde of restrictions, we want to define the canonical decision tree for F and row tilde. Actually, to do this, let's actually reca recap what did we do in the typical proof of the switching in Hastad switching lemma. For example, what happened in Paul Beam's primer on the switching lemma? Well, how, did, how was the canonical decision tree constructed there when F was not an arbitrary AC0 formula, but just a DNF? It was the disjunction of several terms T1 to T2, and rho was not a, a random tree restriction, but just a regular restriction. How did we construct the canonical decision tree. Let's go into that and see if we can modify it for our particular application. So we have this setting. We have F, which is not, not an AC0 formula, but just a DNF now, an OR of several terms. And rho is just a standard P restriction. And we want to construct what is the canonical uh, decision tree for F, for F under the restriction rho. So once again, this is a grab from one of the write-ups, one of the primers on switching lemma. How do we go it? We look at the formula, look at the DNF from left to right. We find the first term that is not simplified completely by, that's not yet been forced to zero by the restriction. We look at that term, say let, 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 that, let that term be T. If that term was simplifies to one by the random restriction, then we are done. We just return one and we're done. If it's not, we put in a complete balance tree for that term and go down to each of its leaves and recurse. This was how the proof of it done. Notice this proof has a very inductive flavor to it. It's almost the same proof could use for a formula. You could, instead of T1, T2, Tm, it could be F1, F2, Fm. You could build the formula, decision tree. Uh, you fi find the first formula that's not yet, that's not trivialized by the random restriction. Put the decision tree for it, and then go down and do it. Modulo one catch. So what's the catch? Notice at step three, when we, have, when we picked up the term that has not yet got simplified by this one, the decision tree for it, it's a term. The ideal decision tree would be this comb-like structure over here. But if you recall Hastad's proof of the switching, like people who are familiar with Hastad, we didn't put a comb. We put the complete balance tree, 
the proof of it, somehow used the complete balance tree in the proof. It didn't use the comb. For this, you need to go into the technical details of the proof. The proof actually, in step three, we put the complete balance binary tree of depth y. We didn't put the comb, the optimal decision tree for t. We put this, this structure. And there's a reason. The proof works only if you put uh, b and not a, somehow in the proof. And what was the reason for this? Somehow this, so one of the reasons is for this proof is you wanted to map every zero leaf to a corresponding one leaf. You wanted a zero leaf to have a one leaf which had the same set, which queried the same set of variables. Zero leaves in the first figure don't have one, do not correspond, don't have, an, don't have an associated one leaf which queries the same figure. So you sort of expand out the tree so that it has this balance property. So we'll define, so first thing we'll do is we'll define this balancing for arbitrary decision trees, not just for combs like that. So basically there's an operation which we'll call the balancing of the decision tree, which takes an arbitrary decision tree and balances it out. The details are not important, but it has the property that every zero leaf has an associated one leaf which queries exactly the same set of variables along the same path. So this is a balancing, this one, we'll define this. And once you define this, it's, we're going to do just plug and play. We're going to take the original definition of the canonical decision tree that happened in the proof of Haskell switching lemma, which happened for just CNFs or DNFs. And you're going to do this for an arbitrary AC0 formula. So if F was the AC0 formula, which was a disjunction of F1, F2, Fm, which were AC0 formula of smaller depth, then what we would do is just find the first one that's not simplified, pick up its decision tree, zero balance it, and then do the obvious stuff. So that's how the canonical decision tree is constructed. Okay, so given the canonical decision tree, this, this is a statement we want to prove. We want to prove the depth of the canonical probability that when this canonical, when you construct this canonical decision tree from a random tree restriction P, the probability that it has a large depth is very small. What we'll actually prove is not this statement, but a slightly stronger claim We'll prove that this is true even if the tree of random tree restriction comes from a particular set tau of where tau could be an arbitrary downward closed set of restrictions. So what is a downward closed set of restrictions? Downward closed set of restrictions is the following. Let me define it for restriction and then I'll go for tree restrictions. A set of restrictions T is said to be downward closed. If whenever it has a particular partial assignment rho, every refinement of rho is also contained in the set, so it's sort of down closed. There is your set more variables, it should contain this one, that's what you mean by down closed. And a downward set of tree restrictions can be defined similarly. I'll not go into the definition, this one. And why does downward closure help in this proof? So we have something like this, we want to un understand what's the probability of this event. You can break down this event into several, this event, we'll say that the canonical decision tree for F has a large depth if certain various sub-events, AL and BL. AL and BL will be typically the same structure. It will be a similar thing for smaller sub-formulae and stuff. So ideally, I would like to apply induction. So we'll have something like this in the proof. We'll have the probability of epsilon. I want to bound it above. It's union bound will tell you it's summation L times probability AL or BL, which you can then split this way. The nice thing about this is we'll cleverly choose the events AL and BL such that they are very similar to the original event E, except on smaller depth and or smaller size formula. So we can apply induction in the proof and be done with. Modulo the fact that what we have here, if it was just probability of AL times probability of BL, we would be done with induction. But it's probability of BL given AL. It's an arbitrary thing under conditioning. And this is where downwards close will come, up, come to our rescue. We'll show that the events which we choose will be downward close, so that even if we had probability of BL conditioned on AL, we could apply the same bond. We have a stronger induction claim, and that will basically let us do the proof. By the way, so for people who have sort of seen Hastad's original proof of the switching lemma, it's uh, really hairy because he doesn't explicitly make this uh, downward closure, this one. It's in the 2014 version of the paper. Actually, the introduction of the paper, he gives a, another proof of the original switching lemma where he explicitly makes the use of downward closed sets, which considerably simplifies the original proof of the switching lemma. And it's the same thing which we use here, but for formulas rather than just the CNFs and DNFs. And then you combine all these ingredients with a heavy dose of Jensen's inequality repeatedly to get our final uh, result, which gives us the 
criticality of AC0 formula and the corresponding uh, uh, tight correlation bonds. I will stop with this. Thanks. We have time for questions. Seems like you don't do Paul Beam's uh, style proof. You we don't do Paul Beam's. Uh, yeah. So it's in some sense, this, we sort of do the first principle proof. It's not any. So um, the the four things over there. It's the proof. It's the proof structure. Similarly, follows Hastad's proof from his 2014 paper. And mm -hmm. arguably, this proof is simpler than all the, all the other three proofs in the uh, mm -hmm. picture. So it's a it's a more of a first principles proof of it. It's not the counting sort of. Proof. Paul Breen's proof is more the Rasboro style of mm -hmm. proof. Yeah, this. Mm. No, no, so. It would be interesting, you know, it's just the fact that the previous proofs didn't have a top-down feature. Here, once you have the top-down feature, you do get this. Uh, the same thing happened in Rossman's case of regular this once. He all, Rossman also uses, uh, it's not just the tree restrictions, it's also the definition of canonical decision tree. It's defined in a top-down fashion. I define the decision tree for F only based on F1 to Fm. Once you have this, this is, this is, it's hard for me to pinpoint where in the proof, but this, it's hard not only in our proof, it's also hard in Rossman's two other proofs, his AC0 formula lower bound and his a criticality result for regular. Once you get this top down and you, then you do the calculations, the D comes out. I don't know where in the proof actually, uh, I don't know how to point it down. But it has to have something to do with the fact that you're like defining the restrictions. So by the way, so this is not the only, rest so there are several, this is the easiest of the random restrictions I can choose. There are other random restrictions which are actually, if they are independent across the coordinates, but independent across coordinates, uh, but and the marginals at each one are the right, this is not the only one. Anything from such a family will give us the proof. So it's not just this one. This is the cleanest and the simplest of them, but all of those will get, our proof can mod be modified to give all of those. But in particular, so this is similar to, uh, uh, the distribution that Rossman uses in an AC0 formula lower bound does not have this feature, and that will not work for this. But there are modifications of it which will work. So it's it's nothing particular about this particular restriction. It's more the canonical decentry definition that's more important over here. That's it. Thanks, speaker, and all the speakers of the day sessions. <laughs> we have a coffee break until twelve.